as folks join us, um, they'll be able to catch up where we're at. I want to say good afternoon. I'm Lisa Berner, Program Specialist for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, and I thank you for joining us today's, for today's webinar on the Monument Quilt. Um, this will introduce you to a full kit of resources to go over how to create safe space for survivors and how to use art and activism for healing, and how to use the quilt to transform local community responses. The Monument Quilt is a crowdsourced collection of stories from survivors of rape and abuse. By stitching our stories together, we are creating and demanding public space for healing. The Monument Quilt is a platform to not only tell our stories, but work together to change how communities respond to rape. The quilt is creating a new culture where survivors are publicly supported rather than publicly shamed. Um, with us today is Rose Quilt. She is Program Specialist for NOWRC. She will introduce our wonderful speakers. And Tang Chim is our incredible IT specialist, and he will discuss the functions of our control panels. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I don't know if Tang, uh, if you wanted to talk about the control panel before I introduce our, our wonderful speakers. I sure can. Would you, uh, are you willing to do that at this point? Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. Welcome uh, to today's uh, go, uh, webinar. Um, we're, um, this session is handled kind of like a meeting, so you can mute and unmute yourself. Um, so the process for asking questions will be both audio or you can use the, the chat box. Um, that'll be that's located in your control panel there to ask questions. So I believe um, they were going to um, respond to all questions at the end, I believe. So if you um, have any questions that pop up during their presentation, feel free to type, feel free to type it in into the chat box there. Um, that way we we have that recorded down and and then they can then address those questions when they're ready. Other than that, I hope you enjoy today's presentation. Great, thanks, Tang. Uh, so just to quickly uh, introduce myself, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Rose Quilt, and um, I am a program specialist with NIWRC. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I have the honor and privilege of introducing our wonderful, wonderful sisters, um, Hannah Brancato, I'm sorry, I, I think I pronounced that right, Perfect. holds an M. I'm sorry. Oh, I just said perfect. I apologize. Um, well, Hannah, Hannah holds an MFA. In, oh, that's okay. My apologies if I mess that up. Um, but Hannah holds an MFA in Community Art from Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, and she established Advocate Through Art at the House of Ruth, Maryland, um, which is an awareness campaign by and for domestic violence survivors. She also co-founded Mother Made Baltimore, a women's economic empowerment project, and her work challenges viewers to think about the connections between personal experience and social injustices. Um, and our sister Rebecca Nagel um, is a, a sister actually to Mary Catherine Nagel, whom um, many of you may know, uh, who's an attorney and a playwright for Sliver of a Full Moon. Um, but Rebecca is an artist, activist, and community organizer um, who lives and works in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, she is the founding director of the No Boundaries Coalition, a, which is a resident-led organization bringing neighborhoods together across race and class lines. And she's a proud member of the, the Cherokee Heritage. Um, and both are co-directors of About Force, um, which is, I will turn it over to Hannah and uh, Rebecca to talk about to talk about that. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you, and um, this is Hannah, and uh, you'll you'll notice that Rebecca and I have similar sounding voices, so sorry for any confusion that may cause. Um, just a couple notes about our presentation. I um, w we can take most of the questions at the end, but if anybody has questions in the middle, go ahead and jump right in. It sounds like there's a little bit of a delay. Um, in the presentation, so just so people are aware of that. And then for the rest of the people helping to manage today, we can't see anybody else's chat. So if anybody chats a question, if you could just call out and let us know about that, that would be perfect. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to begin by introducing Force Upsetting Rape Culture. You'll see the first slide that we have here are two hashtags and our Twitter handle, so not alone. 
Monument Quilt, and then our Twitter handle is Upsetting Wraith. And um, part of the reason that we have this is that we use social media very often as part of our organizing strategy. So feel free at any time during the webinar today to use these hashtags. Um, and also, if you end up doing, you know, um, if you end up doing a workshop yourself, you can use the the social media stuff at that point too. So Force Upsetting Rape Culture is an artist and activist collective to upset the culture of rape and promote a counterculture based on consent. And we do that through creative artist tactics um, that basically help people to imagine an alternative reality, one that supports survivors and uplifts survivors and um, a culture that's based on consent, like I mentioned. So I'm going to just show you a couple of our past projects to give you a sense of how we use art and media as a way to shift our culture and get these conversations going. The project that we're probably most well known for is Pink Loves Consent, which was a web-based prank where we pretended to be Victoria's Secret promoting a line of consent-themed underwear. And so in this prank, we made a fake website and sort of tricked um, the internet for a few hours as a way to just generate a very mainstream conversation about consent, replacing slogans like sure thing on Victoria's Secret underwear with slogans like no means no. And a lot of that um, action happened on Twitter and with college students across the country. And as a follow-up, um, based on the following that we kind of garnered through that action, we did another spoof website called Playboy's Top 10 Party Commandments, The Ultimate Guide to a Consensual Good Time, where we replaced the usual Playboy party school list that highlights um, you know, party schools that usually have high rates of campus sexual assault with a list of t um, 10 student groups all across the country that are doing a good time to promote consent on their campuses and to fight rape culture. And so we kind of compared the past and the present. And again, both of these actions, we try to generate a lot of media dialogue. The image that you're looking at right now is actually a fake Huffington Post site. So we, we try to create these moments of disbelief, um, these moments of belief, rather, um, in which the public that's seeing the project's see how close we are and the fact that we actually can create this culture um, if we try. And so that's that's kind of the purpose for doing these spoofs. And so through those two projects, we've really gained a substantial audience online, um, you know, many young people who are following the work and connected with many activists all across the country who are also engaged in this work to fight rape culture. And um, the other stream of work that we do is about supporting survivors of sexual violence. Um, and so the infograph that you see here really illustrates the kind of shift that we're looking to create. And you probably see a pattern in the work that we've done in the Victoria's Secret spoof, in the Playboy spoof, where we create a comparison. Um, the way that things used to be or the way that things currently are and the way that things can be. And so currently we believe that we live in a culture that blames rape survivors and isolates and silences and blames um, and doubts themselves and that we would like to create a culture that supports rape survivors and says you're not alone and we believe you and it's not your fault. Um, and another you know, important thing about our work is that we're trying to um, help people be empowered to make these changes themselves and to shift um, whether you know they're they're feeling like they're swimming in, in in this culture or that they're impacted by the culture that they feel empowered to change the situation and make a difference. Um, so the project that we're working on most recently is a series of temporary monuments to survivors of rape and abuse. So you're looking at an image of the Vietnam War Memorial. Um, monuments are a place for communities to come together to grieve, to remember, and to heal as communities. Um, and Dr. Judith Herman, who wrote a book called Trauma and Recovery that's about the effects of PTSD on survivors of rape, um, points out that while we have monuments to survivors of war and that we have these public platforms for survivors of war to heal, um, we don't have such public platforms for survivors of rape and abuse. And so we believe that there should be those kind of public platforms. And in fact, it's essential for people's healing processes. Um, so this is an image of one of the first public projects that we did to just begin to um, establish public healing space by and for survivors of rape and abuse. Um, so one of the other important pieces of background information is um, why this is important for Native communities and sort of what the problem is with violence against Native women in the United States right now. Um, so one of the groups that we've been really fortunate to work with with the Monument Quilt um, is a really awesome organization you guys probably all know about um, called White Buffalo Calf Woman Society. 
Um, and they um, have a quote um, that says, um, "Violence against Indigenous Lakota women is not traditional. It's not traditional to our culture and lifeway teachings. We believe it has its roots in an imposed and institutionalized system that was designed to make control." control over us as a people after genocide failed. And I think that the statistics around violence against Native women really support that and that Native women are two and a half times more likely to experience violence than any other ethnic group, but 88% of the perpetrators of violence against Native women is committed by non-Indians. And um, it has a specific legal um, background, um, which those of you guys who are familiar with Mary's play, Silver of Full Moon, know about, which is that um, Native um, nations in the United States don't have criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. So that means that people can come onto Native land, non-Indians can come onto Native land and commit different crimes and um, do that with impunity. And so in 2013, um, VAWA restored the sovereign rights of American Indian nations to prosecute domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking, but it didn't cover um, rape and sexual assault, and it also doesn't protect Alaskan natives. Alaska was carved out of the bill. So while um, 2013 VAWA was a great um, step forward and is an important moment of progress, there's still a lot of work to be done to restore the sovereign rights of Native nations in the United States and also um, to protect Native women from the high rates of violence. And here is a quote from a woman that we worked with in South Dakota um, summer, and um, what she says is, Native women are real, we are still here, and we experience higher rates of violence. We are not some Pocahontas or a fantasy character, we are people. And I think that that's important too, because I think just like, um, you know, when we look at systemic violence against Native women in the United States, it's both laws and culture, and so thinking about what about U.S. culture while we're also working to change U.S. laws, can we change so that there's less violence against Native women? So um, that brings us to our current, our project, the Monument Quilt. Um, the Monument Quilt is an ongoing collection of stories from survivors of rape and abuse, and so stories are collected by, um, stories are sent in by survivors, secondary survivors and allies. Um, this is a story that was created by a secondary survivor that says sometimes she can't let me love her, so talking about being a partner of a survivor of sexual assault. Um, and so as we collect the stories, survivors put their stories on four by four foot red fabric squares and people use different materials um, from fabric to paint. Um, this square is really impactful. Um, the survivor who made this square actually put the um, clothes that she was wearing when her assault occurred into this square. And it's sort of, I think that symbol sort of shows um, what a lot of survivors do with their square is that they have, they feel like they're often carrying the burden alone. Like she said, after her assault, she didn't really know what to do with this outfit. She didn't want to keep it, but she didn't want to throw it away. And for a lot of survivors, they find space within the quilt to let go of that burden that often they carry by themselves. Um, and so um, the Monument Quilt is an ongoing collection of stories. So far we've collected 300 stories. This is a woman from Oklahoma. Um, she's part of the Quapaw Tribal Council, and she made a story and added, um, we did a quilt display in Quapaw, and she made a quilt square and added it to the quilt um, in person when we were there. Um, and so we're continuing to collect quilt squares um, in through 2017, and the long-term vision for the project is to actually blanket the lawn of the National Mall with thousands of stories from survivors to um, create a more mainstream narrative and to really show Americans the epidemic of um, domestic violence and sexual assault in this country. And so our goal is to collect 6,000 quilt squares um, by 2017 and to have the quilt on the National Mall for a week. And in that week, statistically, 6,000 more people will be assaulted. So that's I think will really bring home for people. You know, we talk a lot about statistics, but sometimes they can become abstract and hard to um, really understand and feel on a gut level when we just hear numbers. And I think one of the things that the quilt does is put a face and a story to those numbers that we're so used to hearing. So um, the other thing about the 
kind of underpinnings of why we're doing a quilt is that the there is no one singular narrative um, in how people are experiencing sexual assault. Um, intersections of our identities affect what our experiences as survivors are and um, or victims, you know, however people want to identify. And so we believe that it's really important for there to be platforms for survivors and victims to speak for themselves and to tell their own stories in their own words. And so that's why we're doing this as a crowdsource project. Um, so the image that you're looking at right now is a map um, from this summer. We took a tour across the country and had smaller scale displays of the quilt as a way to continue to generate awareness and spread the message of what the monument quilt is. We went to 30 13 cities and towns um, across the US and um, so we started you know over in Baltimore this is an image from Quapa um, which Rebecca mentioned we partnered with several community groups in each location to bring the quilt to their community um, so there are a couple of kind of underpinnings of the project that we just want to talk about like why why the monument quilt um, so like I mentioned, the, you know, the project is crowdsourced. Another important point is that art and activism are healing. And so um, this is a quote directly from someone who participated in the Chicago Sway. Emily Shaw said, you can't always heal your heart with your head. I've worked in social justice long enough that I don't have any cognitive problems with what happened. I know it's not my fault, and I know I'm not alone, and no one has to tell me that. But even when you know that in your mind, it's hard to know and to feel that truth in your body. Working through art accesses a different part of your healing process that you can't always reach through words alone. And so what this is getting at is that the process of making art itself is very different than, um, than other therapeutic processes might be. And importantly, that again, this is a collective process. So um, individual modes of healing are just one way that people can process um, their experience and and of course as we know uh, as folks that are either advocates or therapists or survivors ourselves uh, it's a lifelong process to heal and so having all of these different options is really important and one of the things that we talk to around activism being healing is um, a couple things one is that surviving sexual assault or domestic violence in and of itself can be a very disempowering experience. You know, one loses control over the thing that we should always have control over, like our body and our choices, you know, and someone in a very violent and malicious way takes that from us in sexual assault. And so this process of, you know, becoming an activist around sexual assault, um, what we've heard from a lot of the people who've engaged in the project is that it's re-empowering over that experience that was disempowering. And I also think that it's important because I think that in our culture, a lot of the models that we have for healing are healing the victim or the survivor. But if you think about it in sort of more of a like transformative justice lens, you know, the individual survivor isn't what's broken or what needs to get fixed. Like what needs to get fixed is, you know, the U.S. culture and practices that create the epidemic of sexual assault and domestic violence in this country that I think is very specific to this country and our culture. And so I think that um, through survivors actually being able to um, share their story in a way that's not just about them sharing their story, but is also about them changing the culture that created their circumstances, that that's, a, uh, that's also an opportunity for a certain type of healing that a lot of survivors don't get access to. Um, and another um, quote that we love from Judith Herman, who, you know, we kind of got this butt of an idea of building a monument for survivors of rape and abuse is that she says activists are building monuments um, through their activism. And so that we're kind of creating living monuments um, through our activism and by connecting with one another. So it's another way of just thinking about honoring um, our experiences and kind of being strengthened by them. So this is a picture from um, the display in Quapa, Oklahoma, and we worked with the Quapa Tribes Domestic Violence Program and LEAD Agency, which is an environmental activism program in northeast Oklahoma. Um, this is a picture from uh, a, the display we did in White River, South Dakota, and we worked with the White Buffalo Calf um, Women's Society to host that display. Um, so another main idea um, with the quilt is reconnecting survivors to their community. 
So um, Maria Beatty, who was one, the main organizer in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, another spot for the quilt, um, she says, our community is not whole without all of the people that make it up. And as part of our community, if survivors are hurting, then the community itself is fractured. We are forever, we are grateful that the monument quilt will give us a chance to publicly support our survivors so that they individually and we, the community, can start to become whole. And I think that really speaks back to what Rebecca mentioned um, and what we've kind of been talking about with collective modes of healing, but in particular that it's not survivors, um, it shouldn't be survivors' burden to carry alone, that it's a community responsibility for us to find solutions to this. And, um, you know, finding that kind of support from community and also a commitment that we're continuing to change the culture together. Yeah. Cool. So this is um, a picture of a quilt display we did at Wesleyan University, and I don't know how much you all have been following the news, but Wesleyan University has had a series of um, high-profile sexual assault cases that have gotten a lot of attention, and the student activists on their campus that had been working for certain types of reform and how the administration handed se handled sexual assault had gotten a lot of backlash. So it was a very hostile campus environment. Um, for survivors, so coming, bringing the quilt to the campus was a way for survivors to feel publicly supported when there had been a lot of backlash previously. This is a picture from Baltimore. And one of the other things that we hear from survivors often um, within the project of the quilt is that it's the first time that they've ever felt safe publicly. So, um, you know, survivors, I think often we carry, you know, these memories, the trauma, even just like the story alone and don't feel comfortable sharing it because people don't know what to say or they don't know how to react or it seems kind of overwhelming to share it. And um, in the space of the Monument Quilt, a lot of survivors talk about how it's the first time they ever felt safe in a public space to not only just to disclose but to um, speak about their experiences publicly and not fear what people's reactions would be but just like feel that they would be supported. This is an aerial shot from Des Moines that we just went by, and this is from um, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Um, and by survivors telling their own stories, we can change the mainstream narrative of who experiences violence. So as I mentioned before, it's important that this is crowdsourced um, and that it's a collective voice and that there's not one narrative. Um, our media can tend to try to control the narrative. So as Mel, Mel Keller says, um, our media can tend to try to control the narrative about who is experiencing sexual assault and how they're experiencing it. Um, and so what she says is what I love about the whole project is the narrative of control by survivors. The diversity of stories on the quilt show how rape affects all people in different ways. When rape victims are discussed in a non-blaming manner, they're often young, heterosexual, white women. The quilt squares made are by male victims of sexual assault, people victimized by family members, partners abused by their intimate spouses, and other people that we don't often um, see discussed in the media to tell an uncomfortable truth. Recognizing these stories is one huge step toward ending rape. So again, intersectionality is one of the huge um, goals and main points of the quilt. This is a quilt display we did in um, New York at the Queens Museum in Corona Park. And one of the other things that um, has happened with the quilt as it's grown is that we've gotten some good um, media coverage. So this was a piece that MSNBC did. Um, this summer's tour was also covered by CNN. And so one of the things that we think about a lot is in the um, language that we're creating and the information that we're creating around sharing survivors is that, you know, it's not just a conversation for survivors, but it's really a conversation we're trying to have in the mainstream U.S. media and conversation to sort of change what people's perspectives and knowledge bases are, and even the language that people use, you know, talking about people as survivors over talking about people as victims and things like that. Mm -hmm. And again, using survivors' own words so that the, when the quilt squares are shown in these news articles, that survivors' own words and their own stories can speak for themselves. Um, so people can participate in the quilt in a couple different ways, and we're going to get now into some of the nuts and bolts of exactly how people can contribute. This is an image of somebody making their quilt square in the very first quilt making workshop actually here in Baltimore at the Spiritual Empowerment Center. Um, and so people 
host workshops in their communities. That can mean faith-based communities. It can mean survivor support groups. It can mean friend groups. People also make quilt squares um, individually, and they mail the quilt squares in. Um, so the quilt squares are four feet by four feet. They're mostly red fabric. They can also have some other color, other colors of paint, other colors of fabric. They can be sewn. They can be, you know, um, painted. They can be written on. And then they basically all get mailed in to Baltimore, where we're headquartered, sewn together, and then displayed. And so we're building up to a big final display in 2017. But as you saw, in between now and then, we're also doing a series of smaller scale displays. We have some also planned for the spring. Yeah. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, too, if anybody feels very excited about the idea of hosting quilts in their community, we can email out more information to folks if you can just send um, your email address to us. Yeah, and the displays that we have planned coming up, um, we're going to do a couple displays in collaboration with a documentary about campus sexual assault that's um, premiering this February or this late this January. We're also going to do a quilt display at Marissa Alexander's trial. Um, she is um, a single mom and a domestic violence survivor and a black woman who lives in Florida who um, has spent three years in prison for defending herself um, from her estranged ex-husband. So she fired one warning shot that injured no one and she has spent three years in jail, which is insane. And she it's going to get out of jail at the end of January and actually faces another trial for a third count and could spend another five years in jail. So we're hosting a quilt display at her trial, um, sort of in protest of her prosecution. Um, and so, and we're actually still collecting quilt squares. So if people want to mail in a quilt square in support of Marissa, um, they can do that. So that, and that also is something for people to think about. Um, we're talking to some a senator around doing a quilt display um, in the Capitol Hill around um, a piece of legislation around campus sexual assault. So really trying to use the quilt, not only like in like when we went on tour this summer, I think the purpose of those displays were mostly to bring those communities together. And they were really effective in the way that we partnered with community organizations and who came to the quilt displays. And now we're thinking about how can we expand the role of the quilt and also use it um, as sort of a tool of demonstration and to highlight these different issues. So that's just something for people to keep in mind. Absolutely. Um, okay, so what does it mean to host a workshop? Um, so basically, hosting a workshop includes a couple different things. Um, this is What you're looking at right now is a step-by-step -step guide. And just so you know, we're going to talk through all of these tools today, but they are also available online. So the monumentquilt.org is the website, and there is a tab. Um, there's a workshops tab. And... Um, in that tab, you can download PDFs with step-by-step -step guides, quilt-making instructions, and all kinds of other tools that you can use. Um, so what you're looking at right now is kind of a general breakdown of how you could think about managing your time in the workshop. And for anybody that you know facilitates groups, I'm sure it's very similar to the way that you work in those group settings. Um, and you know, just so you know, we're going to talk through a couple different ways to do it. But what I'll begin mm -hmm. with is um, the kind of workshop that might be one time over a several hour period with a group that might already know each other. There, you might do several time, um, you do, might do a series of workshops that happens over eight weeks that are 60 minutes each with a group that doesn't know each other yet. You might do a workshop that's drop-in. There's lots of different ways to do this. And so you will, you'll just basically, what we want to equip you to do is to be able to tailor that workshop to your community. Okay, so the first thing is gonna be to um, get prepared and kind of get set up. And we always recommend that workshop facilitators um, uh, work with another person, at least one, if not two other people. The purpose for this is that you're going to be hosting a series of dialogues. People are going to be working with their hands. Um, the project can get overwhelming. It's important that there's uh, at least one person that can just help with like technical stuff, help people figure out how to write on fabric or sew. And there should be another individual available to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. And so two to three facilitators. Finding a space, a space that feels open enough, it doesn't feel cramped or confined, because again, a lot can come up through the process of making these quilts, and so you want people to have space to move around and take breaks if they need to. Um, and then inviting participants. So as I mentioned, you might decide to bring together a group of people that already know each other, um, but it's also possible to bring together a group that haven't worked together yet. Uh, and you know, we'll go through these kind of questions again later, but you're, you're, you should be thinking about, um, is it, uh, um, 
gender specific group? Is it a group of, maybe it's a workshop for allies, maybe it's a workshop for secondary survivors, maybe it's a workshop for survivors of childhood sexual abuse. So just being very specific, maybe it's a workshop for the Free Marissa campaign. There are many different ways that you could do it. Um, and how you put that invitation out is gonna depend on who, who it is that you're working with. Yes, there's an advocate um, in uh, New York, mm -hmm. Lorena, who did a series of workshops with um, VIP Mujeres, and we're gonna actually talk about this at the end, so I don't wanna say too much, but she did a workshop for women who had survived domestic violence, and now she's doing a workshop for family members and allies. So it's sort of like um, extending those circles of the community, so bringing community members together to support their loved ones who are survivors by making quilt squares. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so once you've kind of figured out those logistics and you have your space and you have your participants and your facilitators, I'm going to talk through a little bit about the flow of the workshop. So although, you know, we're, we're sort of flexible um, and you're going to modify all of this stuff to fit your needs, um, here are just a couple of recommendations. So one is definitely figuring out how people are coming into the space. So certainly you'll want to be introducing the monument quilt to the group. Um, we definitely always ask that you emphasize self-care and, um, and you know, encourage people to take breaks if they need to. So you can set up break areas that have snacks and food or that have like coloring pages um, or some other activity like puzzles that can help get people's mind off of the quilt if they need to take a break. So we really encourage you to set those areas up. And again, whether it's a group that comes together in the beginning, you know, 10 people get into a circle and talk together, or whether it's a drop-in, you can have these things in place and you can introduce people to the quilt and to these self-care areas in either way. Um, and then uh, we definitely encourage you to think about establishing ground rules and particularly having a discussion of what a safe space look like to you because what I need to feel safe might be different than what Rebecca needs might be different from what Lisa needs and so having a kind of frank conversation um, to just establish some ground rules amongst the group can be very useful. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all. Uh, another thing is you might consider facilitating a warm-up activity, and this is particularly great if you're doing a longer-term workshop that's extending over a period of a few hours, or if you're doing a series of workshops that's happening over a few days. So um, you can, it, you know, what this does is that it helps people to begin to tell their story, um, and it helps people to begin to think about how they want to tell their story. That it can be a lot of pressure to just sort of sit down in front of a blank piece of paper and think about what they want to say. So here are a couple of prompts that you might use to just get people going. Um, I survived by, a survivor is, and how to support a survivor. And what those three prompts do, especially if you use them together, um, and this, this would be particularly useful for a group of people that might be comprised of allies, secondary survivors, and survivors, is that it allows people to decide how to enter into the conversation. And if they want to identify themselves as a survivor, they can, and there's space to do that. But there's also space for them to be there as an advocate, um, and people don't need to share anything that they don't want to. Really important always to these workshops is that we want people to have a lot of options. So however you can build that into the to your system for hosting the workshop, lots of options are always important. Um, okay, so in terms of making the quilts, um, again, just like writing the story and sitting down and brainstorming can produce anxiety for some people, art making can produce anxiety for people. And so we really encourage you to decide on materials and tools that you as a facilitator are comfortable with so that you can help the group feel comfortable. Um, so if your skill level is like, paint and marker and fabric, that's great. If you want to introduce sewing and bring sewing needles and sewing machine, that's great too. But again, just stay within what your area of expertise is. Um, we just have a few caveats about materials. Please don't use puffy paint, which is very sticky and um, the, the quilts don't keep very well. Don't use washable marker, hot glue, or paper. Those are all things that are going to come off of the quilts, and we want them to last for years and years. And so the other thing to keep in mind with the making section is that what we have observed is that it takes people a half an hour to an hour just to get started and another hour or so to make the quilt. And so if you're doing a shorter workshop, that might mean that people won't finish in one day. Um, and so pe you might schedule a time when people can come back and drop the quilts off. Um, another idea is for people to make smaller quilt squares that get sewn into a bigger quilt. And that those are ways to manage your time a little bit. 
Okay. Um, the final thing is that really building in some kind of closure or reflection time is important to the ritual of the quilt and the way, just the culture that we're building around the monument quilt. And so you can do this in a couple different ways. Again, whether it's a drop-in workshop or um, a workshop that everyone's staying in from beginning to end, there are, are different ways to do it. So if it's drop-in, one thing you can do is invite participants when they leave, which might be at very different times, to just share their quilt with one other person and ask one other person to witness the quilt. Um, and a, an idea if you have the group together, certainly people can go around and show their quilts and tell the story, um, you know, again, always making this optional. People might not feel comfortable verbally sharing the story. You can ask questions like, what did it feel like to make your square instead of asking people to share what is on your square. Um, and then another activity that, you know, wouldn't necessarily involve people showing their quilt squares but would allow people to reflect on the experience, this is something that we do at the end of the quilt displays. And here's an image from Des Moines of us doing the activity. So people stand in a circle and basically they talk about what they brought with them today and what they're taking away. And that can be another really lovely closing activity. Um, and you see we're kind of all holding each other's hands in the middle of the circle. Um, so the, I guess the final, final thing about the kind of nuts and bolts of how to host a quilt workshop is that we are collecting evaluations and they're available online. We have paper evaluations that you could print out and ask people to write down. Um, and they're, they're also um, in an online form. And this is just helping us to track the impact of the quilt workshops on the various communities across the country. So please, we encourage you to, to use those if you do host a workshop. Cool. So now we're going to talk for a minute on about how to support survivors. We put together a packet um, in partnership with a crisis counselor um, called Knowing How to Support Survivors. And the packet is designed um, for lay people, so maybe a little different than, um, you know, most of the people who are watching the webinar who are probably professionals um, in this area. But I think it is a good tool if you can think about, you know, people in your community that might want to help a loved one or might want to help host a workshop but don't necessarily know the best things to say. I think, you know, this is about 10 pages and it outlines in a pretty, like, um, manageable way how to support survivors. So some different things that are in the packets are, you know, one thing that is um, good are things to say and things to avoid. And a lot of times people don't know that they should avoid these things, like asking too many questions and that asking prying questions is a problem or that insisting that the survivor should have reported, you know, instead of saying, um, you know, that would, instead of empowering their own decision-making process. Um, and, you know, some good things to say are to say things like, I believe you, um, would you like a hug? So, like, not assuming that survivors are okay being touched or don't want to be touched. Um, and a couple other things that we like to point out and that we really try and set up the workshop so that these um, ideas around giving trauma-informed care are built into how the workshop is set up. But um, just to point them out more directly, you know, Hannah talked about giving people choices. And you can build that in a lot of ways. Like, you can set up multiple tables in the workshop. Um, a, for the closure activity, you can give people three questions to answer, and they can pick which question they want to answer. Um, but it's good because um, trauma and sexual and domestic violence is someone having their choice taken away from them, and so reestablishing that they get to make their own choices as a survivor is empowering. Another thing that's important is maintaining boundaries, and that's for you as a facilitator in the workshop. So, um, you know, if someone, um, I think that, you know, with sexual violence, it's people are violated by someone who doesn't have healthy boundaries and who isn't healthy at maintaining boundaries. And so the types of people that survival, survivors can establish new and healthier relationships with are people who maintain boundaries. So sometimes rescuing people aren't, isn't always the best mode to operate in, but know your own limits and maintain those boundaries is actually um, healthier. Um, and so, and then in the packet, we also just have some basics of, you know, what PTSD is, how it works, what some of the symptoms are, um, and so that people can learn about that um, and help um, people in the context of a workshop. So, um, like we said before, um, all of these tools are available online um, at themonumentquilt.org under the workshops tab. 
And so there's a place to sign up to host a workshop. So if after this webinar you're excited and you want to host a workshop, we encourage you to sign up on the website and we'll follow up with you. Um, and then the other um, tab is resources for facilitators. So the workshop guide, um, all of these different things are under that um, tab. And soon we're actually going to have a map that's going to show organizations all across the country and towns and cities um, where quilts have been submitted. And so um, that'll be an exciting opportunity to kind of get on the map and really see the scope of how many different people are participating. So look out for that in the new year. Cool. So another thing we talk about when hosting a workshop is self-care. So thinking about your role as a facilitator. And I think just in doing this work in general, um, it can be taxing and um, take a toll on all of us. I know there have been times I need to take a break and focus on myself some from working on the quilt. Um, so if you're planning on hosting a workshop, make sure you also plan to do something nice for yourself. So we have a reflection question. Um, I think the audio is on in the meeting setting and then there's also the chat box. Um, so if people just want to take a minute and chat something nice that you have done for yourself lately. So it could be like go for a walk or um, spend time with your favorite pet or um, with a loved one or a family member. And um, if uh, other organizers could just help us if you see anything in the chat box, I don't know that um, we're able to chat it back or to read it. So. Okay, um, I haven't seen anybody type anything as of yet. Okay, Here that's okay. Nope, we got one from Missy. She says um, she's been working on a personal smash book. Mm -hmm. so. Wonderful. Something nice I did for myself recently is go to a yoga class after a workshop. Thank you, because um, I was wondering what Smashbook was, and she said um, that it's much like scrapbooking. You can find it on Pinterest. Thank you, Mitzi. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Nice. Any other self-care ideas? Or maybe if it's not something you've done recently, something you'd like to do when you have time. <laughs> I'll be taking a hot bath. Hmm. Yum. Read a book with a cup of tea. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Rebecca, what have you done for yourself lately? Um, I did take a hot bath last night. I have a cold, so it helps me when I'm sick. And um, I think I planned two weeks of spending time with my family over the holidays. So mm -hmm. um, I'll have a two-week vacation with family, um, which will be really nice. Wonderful. Yeah. So this has really, you know, this is something that we really try to build into the culture of the project to the point where there are a few volunteers here in Baltimore that, you know, come back pretty often and one pretty consistent volunteer when she was on her way out turned to me and said, what are you going to do to take care of yourself when you leave? So it was really nice to reverse that role and just have it be part of the, yeah, culture of what the Monument yeah. is. And I think that, you know, um, what, um, like, you know, Hannah and I are both survivors and we're doing this work because we are survivors and I you know it's not necessarily true for everyone who's in an advocate role but it is true for a lot of us who are involved in the movement um, you know we're moved to do it because of a personal experience or connection and maybe it's not even our own story but it's the story of a loved one and so it's just important to think about you know how you can you know take care of yourself and also prioritize your own needs in the space of taking care of other people. Yeah, and you know, in the quilt making workshops, I think it's important to recognize that it's really a shared space, right? So you're there as the leader and the facilitator in some ways, but it's also important that there's an, I don't know, I guess an evenness in the way that 
um, the stories are being talked about and that there's not too much of like a distance between the facilitator and folks in the room. And so simple things, even if you can't, if, if you're in a traditional therapeutic or social work role and you can't share your own story, doing things like sharing something nice that you've done for yourself can help to create that kind of space. Okay, so um, in terms of uh, adapting the workshop to your community, so of course we have this template and we like to provide people with as many tools as possible um, in order to prepare you to, you know, host the workshop and bring the monument quilt to your community, but it's really important to consider how to adjust these resources to fit your community, probably as it is. Um, you know, you're going to make need to make some changes for it to make sense. So to begin, there are just some kind of questions to ask yourself um, in order to begin to think about, well, how might the community that I'm working with be different, um, or might what might be the particular needs? And so the first thing to ask is, who is your workshop for? So as we mentioned, it could be for allies, it could be a mixed group, it could be for male survivors, it could be um, only for Native people, it could be um, in a faith-based community. And depending on the answers to those questions, Questions, um, you know, you're going to change the way that you facilitate the workshop. Do the attendees already know each other? That's a really important question as well in terms of how you're facilitating. Do you need to build trust among the group or is there already some trust there? And so what kind of activities you build in will vary. Um, will the group meet once or multiple times? Of course, um, you know, multiple times would allow for extended conversation and follow-up and, and once you want to try to yeah, just think about how you can create closure in a relatively short period of time. Um, and I kind of I, I kind of talked about this, but is the workshop an intentional space for certain groups like LGBTQ survivors, teens, women of color, etc., male survivors? Um, and then have the survivors in the group already share their stories, or will some be sharing for the first time? And so if this is a group um, who've really never been in a collective therapeutic space, maybe they haven't even told um, people in their lives before, then again, the way that things are facilitated might be different than a group who has gone through through um, kind of therapy, have told this story, and even been involved in some advocacy in the past, right? Um, so we have a couple examples um, from different groups who have adapted the workshop just to give people um, some ideas. So the Kennedy Krieger Family Th Center is an outpatient family therapy center in Baltimore, where we live. And it's for um, child, children, survivors of trauma. Um, and it's different types of trauma, but it's most commonly child abuse. And a therapist there did a six-week group therapy session with a group of teen girls who were all survivors of childhood sexual abuse. And so um, the way that she structured the um, workshops and the way that she adapted it is that she did a lot of warm-up activity. So we actually got the list of questions that we suggested earlier for the warm-up, the I am a survivor because I survived by or a survivor is, is that Sarah actually created that for her workshop. And the other thing that she did with the teens and the change that she made is that she, you know, we talk a lot about activism and advocacy and culture change and rape culture in the U.S., um, and she simplified some of that language and adapted it so it's more relevant to, you know, someone who's like 13. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and so she really framed it as um, survivors helping other people and like how can you share in your story help someone else. And a cool thing that happened through this workshop is that um, and kind of goes back to what we talked about where survivors can feel like they're making a difference while remaining anonymous, is that one of the girls who was in the workshop, um, their quilts were displayed at a large display we did in Baltimore, and her quilt was photographed and was in the Baltimore Sun, which is like the main paper. So she, you know, still remaining anonymous and protecting her identity, got to see her story in the paper and kind of like know that other people were she seeing and reading her story and that her story was helping others. So that's kind of neat. Um, another group um, was a women's support group um, that was organized by Lorena, who's like in the middle of the photograph. <laughs> um, and it was at a program called VIP Mujeres, which is a women's um, support group for Latina women in Queens, New York. 
and they met over an eight-week period, and they actually started the support group with the quilt, which is kind of cool. So they had been wanting to start a women's support group, and then they used the quilt-making workshop as the first activity, and now the support group is still going, and they're doing different types of arts and crafts and community-building events, but the quilt was kind of what kicked it off. And um, this is also Lorena, who's the woman who organized the workshops, is now doing a series of workshops with family members and with supporters um, about them making their own quilt workshops. And the other thing that was really special about this group is that um, when we did the quilt display in Queens, um, the display itself was kind of like a family reunion. Like, it was a very positive um, and uplifting event. A lot of their family members came. You can see some of the kids in the photographs, but there were, like, three times that many kids there. Um, and they, um, it was really a celebration, and a lot of the women were very proud, and their family came out to support them and sort of them taking this um, courageous step. So um, it was, I think, a really good example of how the quilt can be used in a way to build community. It's also um, a really good example of cultural, um, adapting it to make it more culturally relevant. So the other, you know, the other important thing about this is that the, this was um, organized as a women's support group, not necessarily for rape and abuse survivors. And something that we've talked a lot with Lorena about is not necessarily using the words rape or abuse um, necessarily, but to talk about relationships. And that might open the conversation up to more people who don't necessarily identify as survivors, but may have experienced, um, you know, sexual assault or abuse in the past. Yeah. And so, I mean, in addition to the fact that the materials are available in Spanish and it's translated into Spanish, some of the language, some of the actual words that are used are also kind of translated. Yeah. And so in some communities, and for a lot of people, they might not be at a place where they're naming their experience, so sometimes having an opening into the project um, that is a little bit different, where you talk about being healthy or taking care of yourself or building community can be a better starting point for people than talking about sharing your story of rape, you know, for, which for some people who maybe aren't ready to, sh to claim or use that language, really, um, there, are other w there are other types of language that you can use that can be more of an opening, because we've found that for some people that that word can be a barrier. <laughs> Um, so another group that we worked with, with was, was the White Buffalo Calf Women's Society in um, Mission, South Dakota. Um, <clears throat> we did a, we also worked with them to do a display. Um, and so this is actually at the end of the display. They had gotten a bunch of balloons, and then we all set them free, which was really beautiful. Um, and um, they did their workshop again over a series of weeks, and um, people made their quilt squares. And one of the things that they did is that in um, Lakota culture, there's um, a tradition of quilting. And quilts in Lakota culture are often gifts. And so one of the things that they talked about in their workshop and that also we talked about in the display, there was an elder um, who knew a lot about the quilting tradition who spoke about um, quilting at the display, is that in Lakota culture, you don't make a quilt to keep or for yourself. You make it as a gift to give away. And so um, sort of framing that idea of, survivors telling their stories to help other people or to like help their community and sort of like making a quilt square as a gift for the community um, and giving it to the project and to this greater purpose. Mm -hmm. I think another thing about the display in South Dakota is that it was a very family oriented atmosphere. It was a, um, both a space for kind of mourning and support and for celebration um, and it was there was a moon bounce you know and I think that like the that way of like creating spaces both for young people and kids and families um, and for people to be telling their stories is something that was really special about that display. Oops. Um, oops, I clicked past it too fast. Um, so the, um, the last question is, and then we'll get to a general Q&A, but the last question is um, sort of who is your workshop for? Um, so if people want to think about um, who their workshop is for, or maybe because I know some people who work for the tribal coalitions, maybe your role wouldn't be necessarily for you to organize a workshop, but maybe you would go and share this information with someone who would, so you could think about you know, what kind of program or advocate or person that you know that you would want to host a workshop if it's not something that you would do personally yourself. Um, so yeah, who is your workshop for? Who would be coming? 
and then what language structure activities do you think will help the group in their healing process? And so again, um, people can either chat their questions or say them out loud, and because I think we can't see the chats from the attendees, we can only see chats from organizers. If the other organizers can help us by either saying out loud the chatted responses or um, just chatting them to us. Um, okay, so one example, um, this is Hannah, and I'm planning a workshop, and um, I'm going to be working with a group called Power Inside here in Baltimore, um, and Power Inside works with women who have previously been incarcerated, um, and also women who have been sex workers, um, and they have a support group every Wednesday that's called a weekly wrap session, and so I'm going to host a short 90-minute workshop in their wrap session, and the idea is that it'll just be an introduction to the monument quilt, and people will begin making their quilt squares, and they will probably continue the quilt squares in subsequent weeks when I won't be there. And so, um, basically, my role will just be to like introduce them to the project, um, and you know, introduce them to materials and get them going. So um, they already have some kind of structures mm -hmm. and activities built into their programming, and so the some of the ideas that we have for warm-ups and, and um, you know, kind of release activities, I'll probably more be following the lead of the regular facilitator in this case than necessarily bringing those activities with me. That's wonderful. I, I like the idea of the different um, modalities of art and, and how they want to use the wrap sessions to be able to do that. Yeah. That's beautiful. And then, like I said, that... Um, for a lot of the, the tribal coalitions, that this would just be an incredible resource that they can introduce and share with the tribal programs that they serve. And I can see the different um, domestic violence and sexual assault programs taking this and, and really creating powerful messaging and, and the healing and, and the support within not only the program but within within the community that this is something that will grow and spread. and. Um, give an ownership to the community, you know, that it, it, may, it can go beyond than just the travel DV essay programs. It can go, as you geared it, you know, for communities to take control and to be supportive and um, really address what rape culture is. And yeah. that um, by public support and sharing, um, it's, it's no longer um, victims being silenced and being shamed. and but more of supporting for them to come out. So thank you so much. I really appreciate um, what you're sharing with us. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, another um, story from the quilt tour, um, we showed a picture of her before, uh, Betty, um, and she is on the tribal council for the Quapaw tribe, and she is a survivor of rape, and so she actually, as you know, an important community leader, at the display told her story and it was really beautiful and moving to see a leader you know publicly disclose that she was a survivor and then also see a community of support and it was something that had happened to her when she was a teenager and so she also told the story of not having that support network when she was younger and so it was powerful to see the contrast of you know, what it felt like, how isolated she felt as a teenager and how she kind of internalized it and felt like it was her fault and then now as an adult to be able to share it and get her community support. Yeah, that, may, that, that is powerful. We do have a question. Oh, it, okay. um, so the question is, um, what suggestions do you have for hosting a workshop within a tribal community and any suggestions on how to engage men in this movement? Um, she said that we host large awareness events during April and October. Would you re recommend having these events separate from typical community awareness events? Yeah, so um, I think that they can, it can be part of community awareness events. To talk about engaging men, we met a really amazing advocate um, who started a group called Wicca Agli um, on the Rosebud in South Dakota, and I'll... Um, before we get off, or maybe I'll look it up now, um, I'll try and chat the website to people, but it's um, a um, program um, for Native men about um, being 
not violent and supporting women and it's um, led by men and was created by men and I think is a really good model for how to do that and sort of going back to um, traditional belief systems um, and really I think looking at cycles of violence as being something that's like imposed from a colonialist power and not um, from indigenous culture which is something that I believe and so um, I think that that organization is a cool model for how to engage men and then in the project in general we talk about engaging men as um, survivors first and and then as allies second just like with women and with people of all genders um, because a lot of men, you know, I think statistically one in six men are um, molested as children. So a lot of men have their own stories and their own experiences. And certainly, um, you know, boys who grow up in houses where there's physical violence and physical abuse are affected by that. Um, and so we, um, I think a lot of times in the movement, we can talk about men's role as being, you know, a role of support, but also with the quilt, we really try and create spaces within the quilt for there to be um, uh, spaces for men to share their own stories. Um, and another thing that I just wanted to mention about the programming timing, um, I think that October and April are those are definitely times that we tend to be busier as well, and it you know it can be great to like focus people's energy. But you know we also want to think about the movement extending outside of um, those advocacy months, and so the the quilt workshops I would say could be part of programming. They could also be lead up or follow up from programming to give people um, like more processing time. Yeah, Great, so one you. thing we're doing in Oklahoma is we're um, hopefully going to go to the state capitol in April is the plan, and we are working with the um, tribal coalition there with Dawn, with the Native Alliance Against Violence, to get mm -hmm. information out to folks about hosting quilt making workshops before um, April, so that way people can do a workshop in advance of the display and then people can actually come and see the quilt in Oklahoma and bring the quilts that they made. So that's another idea. That's wonderful. And then real quick, um, you had the, uh, the quilt where they released the balloons with the White Buffalo Catholic Society and that's in the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. Can you share a little bit more about um, how they hosted the workshop within their tribal community? or what your other ideas may be about hosting a workshop within a tribal community? Yeah, so um, I think that what was really special about the display, which Hannah talked about, was how it brought together different generations. Um, so I think still within a tribal community, thinking about who the workshop is for. So you could do a workshop for survivors, you could do a workshop for family members, um, or you could do a workshop that's for the greater community. I think some of the things that we're talking about is how the quilt can um, contain messages around what the different aspects of um, violence in the U.S. are and create more of a mainstream understanding. So one thing we've done is work with different groups to create quilt squares where the messaging is really clear. So with like Marissa Alexander's trial, you know, we're talking a lot and, the, and people have been making quilt squares specifically for that display about the intersections of um, domestic violence and anti-blackness and the criminal justice system. And so then all of those messages are part of the quilt. So I think one thing in working in tribal communities is to think about what that, what that community needs, but then also like what do people in the U.S. need to learn about violence against Native women? Like what I found and I just think that many people are kind of are ignorant and don't know. And so how can survivors telling our stories um, create greater awareness? Like what we saw um, with FAWA when survivors came and testified and, you know, people's stories were in the New York Times, that that created a great sea of change. And so um, that's a way to think about structuring your workshop, too, or what are those messages? So I hosted a workshop in Baltimore 
I'm queer and I hosted a workshop specifically for LGBTQ survivors and we worked on quilt squares together and sort of came up with what are some key messages about being an LGBTQ survivor that often get left out of how people talk about domestic violence and intimate partner violence and so we made some quilt squares together and then people also made their quilt squares separately with their own stories. Yeah, and I think like with with the Rosebud, the um, the workshop happened as part of White Buffalo Caps support groups, and so um, and I think and my understanding is that the involvement with a quilt has now like extended kind of outside of necessarily that programming. But I think working with existing groups is a good place to begin when you're just introducing people to the project. And then more self-organized things like the last workshop that Rebecca mentioned might be something to build up to. Um, I definitely would, you know, think about it as a series and not as something that would happen once. But something like um, Lorena in New York, she built um, she built the kind of people telling their own stories to the community telling their stories of support. Um, and so I think that that's a great way to think of the whole community as being involved. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Is, are there any other thoughts or questions? Or and we can, a question, Mitzi? Yeah, we can also take general questions now Oops. as well. Q&A. <laughs> yeah, Q&A. So we can continue to talk about specific ideas for organizing workshops if people have any thoughts in mind, or if people have more general <laughs> questions, we can take that now, too. Yeah, and I just wanted to say one more thing about the quilt specifically in tribal communities. I think we, you know, we talk a lot about, like, opening and closing, and I think in um, Native culture and Native spirituality, there's a lot that we do um, to take care of ourselves and cleanse ourselves. So um, at the displays where we've worked with Native communities, we've um, staged the quilts and smudged the quilts and done different ceremonies around taking care of the people who are volunteering for the quilt display that day. Um, and so I think using some of those practices within a workshop space are also um, really great. Like Summer, um, who volunteered with the quilt display, she went home and did um, a name calling with her daughter where they both called each other's names four times to bring themselves back after the quilt display. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. It, it is, it is um, that self-care piece and that it is just so per important when we think about where we're at with our own cultures and how do we utilize and um, practice our culture, yeah. our cultural practices during um, doing something so very powerful and healing um, it's just it's just really key thank you so much for that beautiful I this is Rose um, with NIWRC I just you know again want to express um, you know such gratitude for both Hannah and Rebecca for um, providing us um, so much wonderful information um, about the monument quilt and about what what you all are doing um, I, I just had a, a couple of questions, um, or at least a question and maybe a comment. But um, I know on your summer tour, um, you know, you showed that wonderful map um, of of where where you all went, and I guess took the took the quilt um, and had workshops. And I saw that it was on the east coast. I'm wondering if you guys plan at some point maybe to go um, to the west side of um, the United States. Is that Something yeah. that you guys are planning, perhaps? Yeah, um, that's a that's a good question. Um, so we're definitely doing these. We're probably not going to do a large tour again, like what we did over the summer. I think moving forward, what we'd like to see happen is maybe people organize their own quilt display. So instead of you know force traveling with the entire quilt in a van across the country. The model would be more decentralized and less sort of focused around our travel, but more like people organizing workshops in their community and then doing a quilt display with those quilts um, and community events around those quilts. And we kind of have an idea of trying to, in um, you know, in 2016 before the quilt is on the mall, trying to organize people to do that, you know, during like a one day across the country so that a lot of people are doing things with the quilt on a certain day. Mm, right, because I guess what comes to mind, um, you know, um, and this is so important in, in getting this um, out to the West, but 
Um, I'm also thinking of Alaska. Um, yeah. You know, Alaska, our, our sisters up there, they suffer the highest rates of sexual assault and, and violence. Um, and I know there's so much work that we're doing. I, it would be wonderful to connect you with um, with our sisters up there. And we have a, a re, uh, an Alaska Native Women's Resource Center. Um, and so um, maybe we'll, we could talk offline um, and see how, you know, gauge their interest. Um, but yeah. I think they'd be really interested in, I heard you say, going to the Capitol. Um, so I think taking this to the Capitol in Alaska would be also a wonderful way to um, raise awareness and um, yeah. to really make, make that, that statement. Yeah. And that and messaging I, out there. Yeah, we should really do that. And I, I feel like from meeting Lynn and hearing about what's going on is – um, that's a great idea, and that's you know that's something that we would we would be interested in doing. It sounds like a lot of the um, the oppression of Alaska Native women is happening on a state level. Like the the way that Alaska got carved out of VAWA was from their state <coughs> leaders, and so um, and then yeah, I remember talking about Lynn about some other elected officials and just practices that seemed really horrific. Um, so maybe that's something that we could um, plan on doing, and then and also thinking about <clears throat> thinking about building awareness about Alaska being in the next reauthorization of VAWA. Yeah, so. yeah I think that would be a really important action item. And you know, while we're not going to do another like nationwide tour, we are doing like one-time displays where we're traveling, and we're just you know we're needing to mobilize. Um, resources to make those things happen, but but I, this is something that I think we would be able to rally people behind and help mm -hmm. get support for. So yeah. yeah, please, any you know, I, it sounds like Rebecca's connected already with somebody, but any other connections, um, even just to get folks doing workshops um, and then build up to a display would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Are, are there any uh, thoughts or questions with our participants? We have a Heidi that um, I did unmute you, so just in case you wanted to talk. <clears throat> okay. Um, hello. Yes. Um, I am really excited about doing this here in Alaska, and I think it would be a great outlet for women to share their story and um, just to start bringing healing where. DV, it's been so silenced here in Cake, and just to help bring change for people to see these visual stories of women and encourage others that change is possible. So I'm really excited about trying this here in Cake. Wonderful. Oh, great. Heidi, thanks for, yeah, thanks for speaking up. And the other thing to keep in mind, and we can share our email address, is that if people host workshops, we can already start to help spread the word and, you know, uplift the work that you're doing and the stories. Um, so you can email us pictures to our email address, upsettingrapeculture at gmail.com. Um, and we can, if you want, we can share those on social media. We can link to your websites. We can link to articles that help, you know, create awareness about what people are dealing with. And so please, you know, please keep in touch with us if you do host workshops. I will do that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's wonderful because what I can what I can tell you is that I had the privilege to be able to you know go through their entire website and it's easy to navigate. Everything is printable. It it explains everything very clearly to the self care to creating um, a safe you know a safe space. So if you have more than one facilitator um, helping you, preferably two you know preferably three if possible that you have one person that could be designated you know for like a safe room type of area where if somebody is being triggered that they can sit and talk with someone or to help them or just to be you know in, in a space where they're not being watched by others um, it's just an incredible resource it is just you know they have mandalas they have the sign-in sheets they have everything from 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 start to end and it's just the most incredible wonderful uh, website that I think you'll find very easy, you know, easily navigatable, and it's just, I, th I think it's just a wonderful resource that all programs and all community um, should know about and have the opportunity to utilize it. And because it, it's about healing, it's about, you know, 
creating an environment where our victims are no longer being silenced, you know, that, that they don't have to be the ones to carry the shame of, of the ones who did that to them. And just really, um, you know, upsetting, like I said, upsetting the, the rape culture. And it's just, you know, I, I can't speak more wonderfully about what um, this organization does. And it's just, so please utilize it to its full potential. And I know that Rebecca and Hannah will be able to help you through it all. Yeah, if anyone wants um, help or questions or even just wants to get in contact with us, um, I chatted our email address, but it's upsettingrapeculture at gmail.com. So anybody else have thoughts or questions? Okay. Rose, do you have any closing comments? Um, no, just to once again say, um, again, thank you so much, um, Hannah and Rebecca, um, to th and to thank Lisa, um, NIWRC, for um, providing this this um, uh, very powerful um, webinar and, and information about healing and um, for for the survivors um, and just uh, ways that in ways that we can um, our nations can can look at this and, and approach it um, and just get real excited to hear from Heidi um, who is all, who is a part of the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center um, and you know in seeing how Alaska our sisters in Alaska may possibly move forward so just really just thank you so much yeah, yeah, thank you all. And just to say again, you know, we would be interested in working with you all to bring the quilt to Alaska and raise awareness about what's happening to Alaskan Native women. So we should <clears throat> talk more about that. We'd be really open to that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much for hosting this. And just, you know, we depend so much on shared leadership and people really taking this um, and running with it. And so we appreciate your, your leadership and you're helping us to spread the word about what the Monument Quilt is and the impact that it can have. So thank you for hosting the webinar today. Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, for your just incredible work and for sharing you know, your time and space with us this day. And um, I hope that this is a resource for everybody. So thank you.